Let's go. We got a good one today, people. But before we get started, what's up, good people? It's your boy. Say it with me. The unapologetic, notorious A Smob. And welcome back to Inconspicuous Thoughts. Man, thank you all for your support and continuing support. I mean, the channel is really growing and it's, I'm getting more comfortable with it, you know, still learning as I go, crawl before I walk, as you say. But hey, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Truly humbling. But today, I was trying to think, what can we do? What can we talk about? What can we look at and react to that's going to spark a lot of debate? Well, me, as you can see, I got them boys on the Chicago Bulls. I am an avid Chicago Bulls fan, but let's face it, in the NBA, there is always a debate like who's the greatest team? Who's the GOAT team? Why are they number one? Why is this team not? Like, obviously to me, the Bulls, when they won a championship with only 10 losses, I still say they're the greatest team. A lot of people might say the Golden State Warriors because they only had nine losses, but they didn't win the championship. Some will say the Boston Celtics of the 80s. Some will say the Lakers of the 80s. Hell, you would even say the Boston Celtics legacy as a whole. Because when you think about the NBA, there's two teams that have 17 championships. And of course, Boston Celtics just advanced to the championship. So congratulations to the Boston Celtics. Also, congratulations to the Pacers who had an awesome series. Couldn't get it done, but hey. Don't hold your head down, because when it came down to the Eastern Conference, you were one of the final two. And in the West, as I speak, as I record, you know, you're waiting to see who's going to come out between Minnesota and the Dallas Mavericks. But uh, in this case, I'm going to watch a video. I'm going to watch. You're going to watch. We're all going to react. We're going to spark a lot of debate. So this video is going to, this guy is going to make the case for each GOAT team. Like, why should they really be the greatest team of all time? So, again, you guys watch. And also, don't forget now, your boy's putting in work. Hard, hard work. I needs it, and I wants it. And what I need you to do for me, please, if you don't mind, please, hit that like comment. Hit that like button, I mean, comment. Subscribe, share for your boy. Like I said, I'm working hard here. Somebody out there is going to like what I'm doing and tell them to bring that ass. Come on over. We want you here. <laughs> so as we watch this, I want everybody to sit back and think to themselves, what is the greatest team of all time, in your opinion? And as we go through this, I want you to say, yay or nay? You think it's good? You think it's bad? But we're going to all see together. So let's sit back. This is going to be a long one, people. But let's go. Mm -hmm. The greatest. I know people don't like hear that, but the greatest. Throughout the rich history of the NBA, there have been many different dominant teams who each have their own strong argument for the title of the greatest team in NBA history. Today, I'm presenting a massive compilation video for the teams that I believe have the best argument. Sure, you could add six or seven more teams to this list, but like I said, these are the ones that I personally think stand out amongst the crowd. Let me know in the comments who you believe has the best case. So without further ado, let's get into it. The 1985-86 Boston Celtics. They are universally recognized as one of the greatest teams of NBA history. Although the 80s were defined by super teams and rivalries, the 86 Celtics were never seriously threatened by any opposition that season. They mm. steamrolled the league. Boston's starting five was one of the greatest ever on both ends of the court. The 6'4 Dennis Johnson started at point guard. Beside him was Danny Ainge at the two guard spot. Wow. Then you had Larry Bird at small forward and Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish down low. Beyond their fantastic starting five was their depth. Leading the bench unit was the 6'11 Bill Walton, who was that year's Sixth Man of the Year winner. Then you had guys like Scott Wedman, Jerry Seesting, Rick Carlisle, Sam Vincent, Greg Kite, and David Thirdkill. Looking at the results of this group, we see that the Celtics finished with a league-best 67-15 record, 
They had the third best defense and the number one ranked offense that season. Mm -hmm. They the beat teams by an average of 9.4 points over the course of the season. They dominated the playoffs with a 15-3 and oh, record, and, and they had that season's MVP, everything. Larry Bird. Their head coach was Casey Jones, who often doesn't get enough attention for the success of his team. He took over the Celtics in 1983 and spent five years there. In these years, they went to the NBA Finals four out of those five seasons, Ooh. and they won the championship twice. He had this team playing hard defense, oh, and the back. chemistry was off the charts. Larry was Ooh, basically their verbal passes, player baby. coach and leader. It's often said that groups take on the image of their leader, and in this case, it's very true. If I had to describe them in a word, I would call them unselfish. The ball movement of this team was incredibly beautiful to watch. See, that's another thing that I love. When I look at the old highlights, you know, of the 80s basketball, whether it's Celtics, definitely uh, Showtime Lakers, uh, 76ers, even the Mavericks at that time. Uh, damn, the extra passes were beautiful, man. You know, just being unselfish. You know, it's all about the win, the victory. And I think that's the thing that kind of hurts the NBA now. You got a lot of people that care more about the stats instead of just, hey, Let's win the damn game. But uh, so what do y'all what do y'all think about the eighties? When you think of the eighties, all the great players, Larry Bird won five MVPs. I mean, five MVPs. I'm like, wow. I mean, I'm not dogging the man. No, I am not dogging him. So calm down. I'm just saying the league at that time had so many dominant players, dominant teams, and he won it five times. So wow. Whether I mean, it was on the fast break or half-court sets, Boston was always looking to make the extra pass. Speaking of their leader, Larry Bird won his third straight MVP that season with averages of 25.8 points, 9.8 rebounds, and 6.8 assists on 49.6% shooting. Stats. This was not among Bird's 50-40-90 seasons, but he was incredibly close. Something that people often forget is how Larry was also a very capable defender who made three all-defense teams in his career. Their consistent second scoring option, Kevin McHale, also had a monster season. He was almost always a sure thing whenever he was in the post and had his back to the basket. He had an incredibly high offensive IQ, some of the best footwork in the game, and amazing length with an incredibly high release point on his shot. When McHale was in the post, his teammates often called it the torch. That's another thing. Kevin McHale does not get enough credit for how good of a player he was in the post. I mean, I know we hear, you know, about uh, the four spot. You know, you hear about Carl Malone, uh, you hear about, um, uh, obviously, Charles Barkley, you know, and then later on, you hear p people like Tim Duncan, you know, uh, Kevin Garnett. I mean, I can keep going. Those are the names that are coming up now. But Kevin McHale was just a hell of a player, just gritty, seasoned, uh, just doesn't get enough credit for how good he was, especially for that Celtics team. Um, and then you got uh, Robert Parrish as well. I mean, you got those three players and the length and the size of the three. So you got to think of hitting, you know, going in the paint, banging. You know, those wasn't a lot of banging back then, you know, especially for that team. But they had the length so they know they can block your shot. But, yeah, Kevin McHale is one of the greatest that don't really get talked about a lot at chamber, all. Due to the fact that he was so difficult to stop. That season, he averaged 21.3 points, 8.1 <laughs> wow. rebounds, and two blocks on 57.4% shooting. McHill was also first team Ooh, all defense. There we go. That's that what year. I was talking Speaking about. Speaking of defense, where they really stand out among the all time great teams is their interior defense. Bird was 6'9, McHill was 6'10. They're length. They're length. What Parrish I was talking was seven, about. One. It wasn't just their height, but even more so their length. We don't have a recorded wingspan for Parrish, but it looks like it was at least as long as his 7 foot 1 height. McHale, on the other hand, had a freakish eight foot long wingspan. Ooh. Assuming that estimate is completely accurate, Jeez. that would give him the second longest wingspan in NBA history. Coming off the bench was another six foot 11 big man, Bill Walton, oh, well, who averaged 1.3 blocks and only. You know, while I'm at it, um, you know, Bill Walton just passed away. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know he won a championship uh, with the Portland Trail Blazers in the 70s. Uh, I can't remember his nickname, but uh, yeah, he was a hell of a player before his knees became an issue. But uh, Bill Walton, thank you for your contribution to the basketball community. You s will sadly be missed. Um, I'm going to miss his commentary on the college basketball games on ESPN. Uh, I didn't watch a lot of his early basketball, but I definitely remember when he was with the Celtics. And uh, yeah, man, you know. 
time waits for no man. But again, thank you for your contribution, Bill, Bill Walton, and Godspeed, sir. 19 minutes played per game. Between Parrish, McHale, and yeah. Walton, you have solid rim protection for <laughs> all 48 minutes of the game. This aspect was crucial Get to their away. success in the 1986 <laughs> NBA Finals. The Houston Rockets were just coming off of beating Magic, Kareem, and Worthy's 62-win Lakers. Houston eliminated mm. Los Angeles in only five games. With that being said, basketball is a game of matchups, and as good as the Twin Tower tandem of Ralph Sampson and Akeem Olajuwon were, you're simply not going to beat the 86 Celtics with size, and Boston handled them in six games. Wow. One of the less talked about starters from the Celtics was Dennis Johnson. Dennis was the starting point guard, and over time, he's actually become one of the more underrated and overlooked yes, players very of NBA underrated history. Player. He was a former Finals MVP winner back when he won the championship as a member of the 1979 Seattle Supersonics. He was averaging 15.6 points this year with the Celtics, but he had got as high as 20 points per game during his career. Johnson's final All-Star appearance was just prior to the 86 season, and he received five All-Star selections in total. He Man, was also the Celtics' stacked. best perimeter defender, who they relied heavily upon to slow down the great scoring guards in the league those years. He was second team all defense that season, and in total, DJ received nine mm. all defense team selections over the course of his career. He was also known to be a big game performer and had a smooth mid-range jump shot. You could say that their 6'4 shooting guard Danny a But yeah, when you think about that team, you know, you got to think to yourself, geez, they just got so much death, uh, the team as a whole. And uh, Dennis Johnson, one of the best players that no one really talks about. Uh, is he Is he a Hall of Famer? I hope he is. I mean, he's done enough to where he should be a Hall of Famer. I mean, it would be sad if he's not. But, um, yeah, I mean, the man is – the whole team as a whole – I mean, like I said, when you think about the Celtics uh, team in the 80s, you got to realize they won 67 games and the Lakers won 72. So you had at that time, you had two teams with 60-plus wins, and you just think about them as a whole, and you go, man, how, you know, how was they able to pull it off? But they pulled it off, and that's the best thing about it. Uh, good thing, but uh, sorry, too much talk. <laughs> course of his career. He was also known to be a big game performer and had a smooth mid-range jump shot. You could say that their 6'4 shooting guard Danny Ainge was the worst player in their starting five, but he was certainly far from a bad player. Danny averaged 10.7 points oh, really? and 5.1 assists he was the season, worst on, and he was actually very lineup. efficient in his contributions as he shot 50% from the field, 36% from three-point range, and 90% from the free throw line. Danny was also incredibly scrappy. Oh. He was a big trash talker. There he is. And one there of the OG is. floppers that's, that's of the, NBA that's history, scrapper. which can easily be seen as a negative, but I can tell you as a Lakers fan who watched him play, there were plenty of times where Danny knew how to get under the offensive player's skin and would get the ref to make the <laughs> crucial the calls when they mattered most. He's just trying to it throw the players off their game. Danny, but only and because he, he was it. good at that's, it. Hey, the that's a role never player. Seriously may not show up in the stats, but that's a role player. Despite a 49 and 63 point performance from Jordan, they swept the Bulls in the first round. After Ooh. that, they easily handled Dominique and the Hawks in just five games. <laughs> then they swept Sidney Moncrief and the Bucks Damn, in the conference Milwaukee finals. Bucks, As I mentioned earlier, the and Rockets beat, did uh, push Houston. them to six games in the NBA finals, but the Celtics got up to an early 3-1 lead and the series wall. was never really in doubt. What makes the 86 Celtics so dangerous is that they can attack you in so many ways offensively while being mm. so versatile defensively. There isn't another team in NBA history that I could put against the Celtics in a seven game series where I would feel like the Celtics wouldn't do well against them. On offense, they could run the fast break, Ooh, but they could also slow pass. it down and run things through the post. They could pick mm. and roll you all day with their bigs, they could punish you from the outside with the all-time great shooting of Larry Bird, or they could simply run the mm. isolation through McHale, which is always a good option. Boston natives know this already, but for the mm. rest of you, it's important that you recognize the 1986 Celtics have a legitimate case for the title of greatest team of all time. The 1982-83. Okay, so we got the 76ers next. Um, man, so when you think about like I said, what we just looked at, you know, the Celtics. Um, wow. 76ers. So, again, the debate. 
that's what this is all about. That was the first team. Now, the next team up is the 82, 83, 76ers. Now, of course, my son, he's a big Celtics fan. There's a lot of old heads who watch the Celtics, you know, their dynasty, you know, 17 championships, and now they're going for their 18th now. Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish. That was a big three for your ass. <laughs> when you think about it, that's their big three, man. People complain about super teams. Now, granted, they got theirs through trades and drafts. You know, it wasn't like, hey, let's get a bunch of our friends and let's uh, play together, which I'm not against. But, man, you cannot deny how good the team that was and how selfish, just unselfish. They made that extra pass because it was all about the win. Now, I know he said what he said about uh, Danny Ames, but I know a lot of players where a lot of what they contribute to the team doesn't show up in the stats. But Danny Ames was a bad boy. Don't let his stats Fool you that, oh, he wasn't that good in the start line. No, he was good. So, again, all the Celtics fans out there, you know, be proud of your team. Comment in the comment section. So, let's move on to the 76ers. So, let's see what their case for the GOAT team is. Philadelphia 76ers. Sandwiched right in the heart of the Lakers and Celtics dynasty days is one of the greatest teams of all time and a team that some even consider as the best of the best. Really? In the summer of 1982, I mean, the 76ers Malone. signed the superstar, Moses Malone. Mm. He was in the prime of his career, coming off of an MVP season with the Houston Rockets. Waiting for him there was the lethal man known as Dr. J, Julius Irving. In 1982, before they had acquired Moses Malone, the 76ers were already considered one of the best teams in the league. They had won 58 games and pushed the Lakers to six games in the 1982 NBA Finals. They had come extremely close to winning the championship, and then they simply improved in the offseason by adding the league's MVP. A tandem of Dr. J and Moses is terrifying Man. enough in itself, but they had much more firepower than that. I mean, y'all look at this picture. Let me get myself out of this shot. Look at this. You got Moses Malone and Julius Irving on the same squad. <laughs> wow i mean now we see a lot of it happen you know you know you'll see lebron and Kyrie and it was on the same squad you know you got kevin durant and uh seth curry i mean seeing a lot of the super team stuff now is simple uh, i know a lot of people angry about it listen i don't care because all of us know we would love to get paid millions of dollars <laughs> and hang out with our friends at the same time and just kick everybody's ass in whatever sport it is. <laughs> but to have a legendary, legendary duel like that is crazy, man. But hey, that's the beauty of the NBA at that time. Four that out of their five starters off. were named NBA All-Stars in that 1983 season. Starting at the point was the Hall Ooh. of Famer, Maurice Cheeks. The 6'1", 27-year-old loved the fast break, and he was mm. an excellent facilitator and an excellent defender who made first-team all-defense that season and a total of five all-defense teams over the course of his career. More specifically, Maurice was one of the greatest pickpockets of NBA history and currently stands <laughs> fifth on the all-time list in steals. Starting at the two-guard spot was the efficient scoring shooting guard, Andrew Toney. As a 25-year-old, he was in the prime of his career and put up 19.7 points and 4.5 assists on 50% shooting over the course of that season. At the three was the 6'7 small forward, Julius Irving. He was 32 years old and technically just past his prime seasons, but with that being said, he was still lethal and one of the best wings in the league. That season, he contributed with 21.4 points, 6.8 rebounds, and 3 points. Now think about that. He got he averaged twenty one point four points a game, and six point eight rebounds per game, and three point seven assists, shooting fifty one point seven from the field, and he's past his prime, y'all. <laughs> There's people in this league right now that is not even shooting at that, but he's past his prime. Interesting. 0.7 wow. assists on 51.7% shooting. 
Their weakest spot in the starting lineup was at power forward. The 6'8", 26-year-old rookie, Mark Ivoroni, contributed just five points and four rebounds in his 20 minutes per game. But when you're surrounded by all-stars, I can understand why it can be <laughs> hard rookie. to achieve God. nice numbers. Damn, no pressure. Starting at the no five pressure, was kid. arguably the most underrated center in NBA history, Moses yes. Malone. Moses was once again Moses absolutely dominant Malone. that season, both as a scorer that and a boy looked like the villain he in a black exploitation film. Of 24 point <laughs> five points, a league leading 15.3 rebounds right, and two again. blocks on 50% shooting. Here we go again. You know, you look at those stats, you know, 24.5, 15.3, two blocks, 50% from the field. Man. He was also first team all defense that year. Coming off the bench was their go-to six man, the six nine power there forward Bobby Jones. He yeah, played 23.6 minutes that per game that season, slick. and his nickname Hell of a was defender. the Secretary of the Defense, Secretary and for good defense. reason. Bobby was a five-time All Star <laughs> who made a, 11 now that's a name for your over ass. the course of Secretary his career. Of he defense. was so good defensively that season now, that why Bobby made the first then? team I all defense you want that as the sixth man. I understand Needless you want to say, he was that year's winner of the. To come off the bench but why wouldn't you just have him there i mean you could take you could have him start drop him bring the rookie in and then bring him in with the second unit but that's easy for me to say i'm not a coach but secretary of defense that's a that's a killer that's a killer Six man of the year i love it between malone maurice cheeks and bobby jones the 76ers represented half of the entire NBA's first team all defenders that year. Mm. Rounding out their rotation were additional decent pieces in Clint Richardson and Clement Johnson. With Maurice Cheeks and Irving, uh -oh. they were fierce Baby in transition. Sleep. But Bam. if they wanted to slow things down and run a power offense through Moses, they could do that too. Mm. Looking at the results of this group, we see that the 76ers finished with a league best 65 and 17 record. They had statistically the fifth best defense Ooh. and the fifth best offense that mm. season. They beat teams by an average of 7.7 .7 points over the season. They utterly dominated the playoffs, Damn, finishing the postseason with a 12 and one record. And they had that season's MVP, okay, Moses MVP Malone. As well. Moses is still the only player in NBA history to win back-to-back -back MVP awards on two separate teams. This team mm, was absolutely incredible and was clearly the best throughout the season. And they knew it too. Heading into that postseason, a reporter asked Moses how he expected his 76ers <laughs> to do in the playoffs. And his response was, Fo, 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 meaning the amount of games they would play in each series. To say their confidence was high would be a massive understatement. A big factor of why the 76er team is so unbelievably great is. I need to Google that one. So, did they only play three rounds back then? Because I'm like, it's four rounds of playoffs now. You got the first, second, then the conference finals, then the championship. So, over 4 4, so they only played three rounds back then, so I'm gonna have to check that one out and see uh, what happens. It's because of the strength of their playoff schedule and how they dominated regardless of the competition. They started by sweeping a solid New York Knicks team okay, and only I'm four find games. Out right now. After that, in the Eastern Conference Finals, they had a meeting Whoa, with they the only powerhouse played three Milwaukee rounds Bucks, back then. who had names like Sidney Moncrief, wow. Marcus Johnson, and Bob Lanier. If that doesn't tell you how strong the Bucks were, consider the fact that this Milwaukee team was coming off of a four-game sweep over the Bird, McHale, and Parrish-led Boston Celtics. <laughs> Up to that point, the Celtics had never been swept in their 30-year playoff wow. history. Despite the Bucks looking like a more than formidable matchup, Moses and the 76ers still dominated, defeating Milwaukee in four only five one. games. <laughs> Winning for them in the finals was well, the defending four, champions four and the team that beat them last year, the Magic Johnson and Kareem-led Los Angeles Jeez. Lakers. The Lakers seemed poised to be the resistance that the 76ers needed, but the truth is absolutely no one was slowing down the 1983 76ers. In those finals, Malone absolutely destroyed Kareem and the Lakers, putting up 25.8 <laughs> points, 18, 18 rebounds, and 1.5 steals and 1.5 blocks on 50.7% shooting. No, and he 50, was rewarded yeah, the finals MVP the as they stunned the basketball Four world no. by sweeping they the juggernaut swept. Lakers. That 12-1 postseason run is still, to this day, tied for the fewest losses in NBA wow. playoff history. This would be their only championship in the 80s as Julius was beginning to reach the twilight of his career. But as far as that single season, all the perfect elements collided wow. to make the perfect storm. And the result was a team with a strong case for the title of greatest in NBA history. The 2000-2000... to Ooh, we're getting ready to get nitty with the Lakers. So... With that being said, as I write down the next group here, um, do you think that takes away from the 76ers that at that time, or any team, that they only played three rounds? 
you know, because in my, I just always thought it was always four rounds, but to just play three rounds, can you imagine if, say, the Pistons of the late 80s and the Bulls of the early 90s, uh, the Houston Rockets and so forth and so forth, only had to play three rounds? So does that take away from the 76ers accomplishment? Me, I say no, because it's the rules that set for them. So you would play two in your conference, and then you'll play the one series against the West. But, man, to think about they swept the Celtics. You know, people always talk about, you know, now, you know, LeBron getting swept or Kevin Durant and all this other stuff. People don't even know the true history of the NBA like me. I just learned that the Celtics got swept. In my opinion, I would go, there's no way in hell a Larry Bird, Kevin McHale team would be swept in the playoffs, but we're all human and the best can lose to a greater team. So again, to my 76ers fans out there, if you're watching this, make a case for your team. Are they the GOAT team? You know, when you think about uh, their accomplishments and now we're getting ready to go to the Lakers of 2000, 2001. Lord, this should be interesting. One Los Angeles Lakers. Famously known for one of the most dominant postseason runs in sports history, led by one of the most dominant duos ever, a 29-year-old Shaquille O'Neal mm. and a 22-year-old Kobe Bryant. This was the closest thing we ever saw to a prime Shaq and a prime Kobe on the same team. This was the biggest moment of overlap of the greatness of both players. Shaq was still at the height of his powers as Kobe was experiencing his breakout season as one of the NBA's leading scorers while continuing to be an elite defender. Additionally, this Lakers roster was arguably their deepest of any of their modern championship runs. More often than not, starting at the point guard position was the experienced veteran, Ron Harper. He shot about 47% and chipped in just seven <laughs> points a game, but his experience and reliable defensive abilities often go overlooked. The Lakers didn't have a star point guard, but people often forget how deep they were at that position because backing up Harper was Derek Fisher and Brian Shaw. Fisher Jeez, was 26 years bench. old, and although Harper started more games, Derek chipped in with numbers of 11.5 points, 4.4 assists, and two steals on 41% shooting. Whenever the defense would collapse on Shaq, which was basically all the time, Fisher was one of those solid options for him to kick the ball out to, as Derek shot 40% from three-point range over the course of the regular season and shot a ridiculous 51.5% from three-point range during the playoffs. Fisher was one of those guys who did all the little things well, whether it be hustle for the loose ball, take a charge at a crucial moment of the game, or automatically knock down free throws from Rasheed Wallace's technical fouls. Fish was the... <laughs> Rasheed Wallace's technical foul. So again, there's players like Derek Fisher, you know, that's on a GOAT team, where it may not show up in the stat line how important and what his contribution to the squad was, or is, but... Ron Harper, man, people sell him short. And of course, I'm a Bulls fan. I just know how Ron Harper used to pesterize and just terrorize. I mean, he's a two guard, but the Bulls were so stacked at the other positions that this man to be in the starting lineup, they made him the point guard. That didn't mean he brought the ball up because obviously uh, Scottie Pippen brought the ball up. He was the point forward of the team. But when you think about Shaq and Kobe, those two by themselves were a menace that they both can average 30 points a game a piece to where you just look around all we need is 12 here 10 here 15 there whatever it all adds up but yeah i always love when you look at some of these great teams and you look at their stats of some of the players and you think why were they on the team because they were important it was that simple they don't have to average 30 points to say that they didn't mean anything to that squad. So definitely wanted to point that out. I know I've did it with the other two, but yeah, it's it's amazing when you look the at some of these teams. The kind of role player that any team would want when the games matter most. Brian Shaw was a large 6'6 point guard slash shooting guard. Sometimes mm -hmm. he would back up Harper and Fish, but he would also come off the bench for Kobe as well. Shaw was another reliable option for Shaq to kick the ball out to, as he too upped his game in the playoffs, going from 31% three-point shooting in the regular season to 35% in the postseason. That 4% makes a big difference. Shaw was also one of the best lob passers in the entire league. 
Kobe would sometimes be on the receiving end, but he was more known for Shaq. his connections with Shaq. <laughs> the alley pass from Shaw to Shaq, Shaq was coined the Shaw Shaq Redemption Shaw in reference Shaq to the Redemption. movie The Shawshank Redemption, which is an all time great movie, by the way. Kobe obviously started at the two guard spot, and this was the beginning of him torching the league. He had improved his scoring average by six points from the previous season as he averaged 28.5 points, 5.9 rebounds. Wow. This man went from six points a game to 28.5, 5.9 rebounds, five assists, and 46.4% from the field. Wow. So I want, I'm wondering if he won the most improved player award as well, but that's some crazy stats differential. We're talking about a difference of 22.5 points a game, y'all. <laughs> hey, Charlotte, how was Lolly Divots? Because that's who y'all traded this man for. <laughs> Rebounds and five assists on 46.4% shooting. Mm. He was also second team all defense that year. Starting at the small forward position was the 6'7", 31-year-old yeah, Rick, Rick Fox. Fox. He was yeah. a solid contributor, putting in about 10 points, 4 rebounds, and 3 assists over the course of the season. Forgive me if I'm starting to sound repetitive at this point, but Fox was yet another reliable 3-point shooter for the ball to be kicked out to, as he shot 39.3% from that distance. Starting at the power forward was the Lakers' big acquisition in the offseason, the 6'10 Horace Grant. Horace mm. was 35 years old at this point, so he Horace, wasn't what he was with the Bulls and Magic, but he still chipped in with about 8.5 points and 7 rebounds a game. He also helped Shaq significantly with the interior defense, which was huge, considering how strong the power forward position was in the Western Conference at that time. Everyone knows about the guy starting at center, the 7-foot-1-inch, oh, yeah. 325-pound Shaquille O'Neal, the most dominant big man since Wilt Chamberlain. Shaq was coming off of his near Jeez, unanimous MVP season with almost identical numbers <laughs> like run. Point seven points, 12 points. <laughs> Look at this man's stats. Look at his stats. 28.7 points a game, 12.7 rebounds, 3.7 assists, 2.8 blocks, 57%. I mean, I know there's a lot of people who've been watching basketball longer than me, especially the NBA. So there's always a debate who's the best center. You know, obviously, uh, Kareem, uh, Hakeem, David Robinson, Patrick Ewan, uh, David Robinson, uh, even Yao Ming's in there, even though he didn't get to play very long because of his foot uh, problems. But Shaq, Shaq was a problem. And if I missed anybody in there, it's, it's just because it's coming off there right now. I could put Rick Smiths in there as well, the Dunkin' Dutchman. But Shaq was a problem. <laughs> Shaq was a, oh, hell no, nah, run type of problem. <laughs> Shaq was that, you know what, baby? He can go ahead and take everything because I ain't got time for this kind of problem. <laughs> But I'm fortunate enough to say I got to watch a lot of Shaq. Um, but, man, the man was a beast, especially in his Orlando days, too, when he had, uh, what was it, Shaq Diesel was his first CD that he had. I actually have that CD still. <laughs> 0.7 rebounds, 3.7 assists, and 2.8 mm. blocks on 57% shooting. There's not much that I could tell you about the Diesel that you don't already know. But exactly. simply put, in many ways, Look at this. Shaq <gasps> defined that era, Get the hell out of the way, in the Western Conference. All of the contending teams were focused on acquiring big bodies LA. to throw at Shaq in order to challenge his physicality. And yet, regardless, Shaq still dominated playing bully ball. Ooh, Filling bitch. out the roster Get was the 6'9 power forward, who was one of the most clutch oh, role players Robert the Ory. game has ever Man. seen, Robert Ory. And then you had Devin George, Tyron Lue, Jeez. Isaiah Ryder, Damn. Slava Medvedenko, and simply the greatest dancer of all time, Mark Madsen. Madsen. Looking at the results of this group, <laughs> we see that the Lakers finished with a 56-26 and 26 record, which was mm. the second best in the league. They had the 21st ranked defense and Ooh, the number look two at their ranked defense, offense though, that but the season. Offense is they beat teams by an average of 3.4 points over the course of the regular season. They historically dominated in the playoffs with a 15-1 and record, 15 although and they one. did not have that season's MVP, who was Allen Iverson. 
A few of these things are the reasons the 2001 Lakers don't get more credit in the case for the GOAT team title. Because a 56 and 26 record is significantly yeah. worse than most GOAT team candidates. Plus their defense was in the Damn, bottom half 21. of the league. And they weren't typically blowing teams out either the league as their defense. margin of victory was relatively pretty low. For example, the 86 Celtics, who I've already done a video on, had a margin of victory that was nearly three times that of the 01 Lakers. But to completely disregard the Lakers for these reasons could be something that's lacking. Okay, so let me step out here and y'all look at these stats again. So the record was 56 and 26. They were ranked 21st in defense, second in offense. They beat a team by an average of 3.4 point, point, excuse me. But they ran through the playoffs. But no MVP because Allen Iverson got it that year. So do that mean they shouldn't be in this conversation? This is me asking you guys. Do that take them out of the GOAT conversation? Because to me, it doesn't. They can be like the top five if you want to because I just feel like the league was so balanced then. I mean, you look at the 76ers team that year as well. They were very good. But to me, I don't think it takes them out of the conversation. It's just, man, 56 and 26, and you had Kobe and Shaq on the team. That's, that's kind of nuts. Man. A bit of context. The 2001 Lakers were coming off of a season where they had just won the championship. Watching most of that regular season, they often seemed complacent, and it appeared as if they were simply cruising through the regular season before they eventually turned up the intensity just in time for the playoffs. And mm. man, yeah, they I turned it up. The Lakers won the final eight games of the regular season heading into the playoffs. Combine that with their 15-1 postseason record, and the Lakers finished the most difficult time of the year, winning 23 out of 24 games. What was incredible about this team wasn't just the fact that they went 15-1 in the that playoffs. Pass but it was who they beat to go 15 and one. This was at a time when the Western Conference was stacked with talent and powerful teams. They started their postseason uh. run up against the 50 win Portland Trailblazers, the same team that had pushed them to seven games in the Western Conference Finals the previous season. They destroyed the Blazers, sweeping them in three Damn, games with an three. average margin of victory of 14.7 14. points. The second round was against their Ooh, rival, the loaded 55-win Sacramento Look at Peace. all these teams with well, 50 or more the wins hype, in the West. The Lakers swept them, too, Forward, winning by an man, average of 9.2 points. Get the broom, Shaq baby. and Kobe's imprints were all over this series. As Shaq dropped 44 points and 21 rebounds in Game 1, and then 43 points and 20 rebounds in Game 2. Damn. Then it was Kobe's turn as he dropped 36, 7, and 7, seven in Game seven. 3, and 48 points Jeez. and 16 rebounds Choose in your poison, four. people. Choose Surely your poison. Surely the San Antonio Spurs would give a greater challenge. This San Antonio squad was led by Tim Duncan, David Robinson, and Derek Anderson. They had finished the regular season with a 58-24 and 24 record, which was the best record in the entire league, even wow. greater than the Lakers. On top of that, San Antonio had the best Number defense in, in defense. the league as well. The Lakers were not supposed to sweep this team. But not only did they do that, but they absolutely demolished them with an average margin of victory of a whopping 22.2 oh points. Oh my goodness. Kobe was leading the way. Against the best defense in the league. Seven on 51% shooting. <laughs> Iverson's iconic 48 point performance was good enough to steal game one of the NBA finals. But after that, it was business as usual for the Lakers. And this time it was Shaq leading the way. Oh, poor Dikembe in that series, and 16 man. Rebounds oh, on 57% shooting over the course of the finals. Ooh. These were the averages Ooh. of Shaq and Kobe <laughs> over the course of the entire playoff. Look at these stats. Look at the stats, people. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> okay, let's just put this into perspective. So they coasted the whole season because they knew no team was going to be able to beat them in the playoffs. Let's just put it. Let's just state facts. The Western Conference had that many teams with 50 victories or more. They beat the best defensive team in the league that season. And they swept them. Only loss was against 76ers in the finals. They record doesn't state facts here, man. Them boys just said, hey, we know we're going to win it. Let's just not get injured. <laughs> but them stats are crazy. Oh, Lord, you can argue mercy. who was Batman and who was Robin over these playoffs. 
but whoever was Robin probably put up the greatest playoff performance from a Robin in NBA history. After the season was over, everyone in the media was comparing this team to the 96 Bulls. Over mm. time, people haven't made that comparison as much, since I think a lot of people have forgotten the context that shows just how great this team was. Ultimately, this Lakers squad had it all. Two all-time great alphas, a collection of shooters who are surrounding stars that demand so much of the defensive attention, clutch performers with championship-level experience all over the roster, and arguably the greatest coach in NBA history. This Lakers unit would likely challenge mm. any other all-time great team. When I say the 1980... Ha ha ha, them damn Pistons. Okay, so let me write this down right quick. So, 88, 89 Pistons. Okay, so let's go back more with this, the, the, the Lakers. That, to me, is how you build the perfect team. You got two alphas. Alpha 1, Alpha 2, how you want to say it. Forget that Batman and Robin shit that you always hear. You know defenses are going to be so focused on those two. That's where you get the shooters. I mean, God, you know, I look at teams like the Milwaukee Bucks, you know. You know, you got Giannis. Uh, you got uh, Dame Litter on the team now. Of course, they both got injured this year. It's, it's the nature of the beast in the playoffs. You put a bunch of shooters with them, I tell you what, the Milwaukee Bucks can be just as good as what the Lakers were because Giannis is so big, he, he could be the Shaq. And then Lillard, we already know what Dame Lillard can do. So he's the Kobe. And you just put so many great wing shooters. Man, Milwaukee could be such a beast. Uh, let me think of another team that could do it. I think, I think San Antonio going to do that. I'm going to say his name wrong, Benwami. Benwani, however you go, put it in the comment section. I think that team is going to be a team to be a problem with many years once they get the right assets around him. Um, I know we're talking about GOAT teams from the past, but I'm thinking about the future. And, Lord, San Antonio is going to be a problem because that kid proved it this year. He should have won. He should also won Defensive Player of the Year. I know he won Rookie of the Year. They gave it to Rudy Gobert. But when you look at their stats, man. So you look at like him. Can you imagine in free agency if they can get a good two behind him? And then they got so many core and young stars to build. I mean, obviously, uh, OKC, they're not going to be able to keep that team together because money is everything. But OKC's got a good young core. Uh, look what they're doing in Minnesota right now. I mean, they don't look like they're going to beat Dallas, but. Damn, you know, Anthony Edwards, man, the Ant-Man, whatever his nickname is. I seen some flashes of greatness. I mean, right now he's kind of struggling at the worst time, but it's easy for me to say I'm sitting at home watching it. But uh, who do you think is going to be the future GOAT team? I mean, when you look at teams now in the NBA, not so much now per GOAT, but like five years from now, we'll be talking about these teams like, damn, we saw them at rise from the ashes to being one of the greatest teams right now. So uh, as far as the Lakers, man, that was good. But 56 losses, not sorry, 26 losses. You know, people will say, oh, that means they're not that good. I think them boys just played the season with, let's just get to the playoff and kick your buddy ass like they did. <laughs> so let's get going. Let's go. Detroit Pistons. What are some of the words about them that come to mind? Intense, physical, violent, Ooh. the bad boys? Those are some common choices. But what about deepest team in NBA history? What about greatest team of all time? Despite the unpopularity of those statements, there's actually more merit to it than most people realize. As much as me and my dad hated the Pistons in years past, yes. for in my opinion, their overly physical and instigating They're the reason nature, why I'm a Bulls we've fan. also never failed to recognize how talented, skilled, and simply good that team really was. One of the best collections of talent the league has ever seen. Leading the team at the point guard spot was one of the greatest ever at that position, the dazzling 27-year-old Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah was one of the greatest dual threats of all time, as he could beat you in multiple ways, whether it was as a scorer or as a distributor. You had to respect both aspects of his game, and he was incredibly difficult to keep up with, as he was also one of the greatest well, with the Hall of Globes trying to dribble. Before Kyrie Irving and Allen Iverson Damn. were impressing audiences and confusing was, uh, defenders with their right incredible there. handles, that was Isaiah Thomas's thing. <clears throat> 
on the season, mm. Isaiah averaged 18.2 points, 8.3 assists, and 1.7 steals on. Again, you look at his, his stats and people go, well, is he really that good? He's a point guard, people. So where you're really looking at his stats is he set up his teammates in that 8.3 assists a game. Sort of like John Stockton as well. And of course, Larry, uh, not sorry, not Larry, Magic Johnson. But Larry Bird too as well. But we're looking at the point guard position here. And dude, 1.7 steals a game on 46.4% shooting. Goat it. It's good stats, baby. Let's go. On 46.4% shooting. These numbers were nice, but they were actually a little bit below his usual standards. And a big part of that was the fact that less was required of him this year, as Detroit mm -hmm. was loaded with so many offensive weapons this season. Joining Isaiah in the backcourt was Dumars. the 6'3", 25-year-old Joe Dumars. Joe, over time, has become one of the more overlooked all-stars of NBA history. He was just beginning the prime of his career and put up averages of 17.2 points, 5.7 assists, and 2.5 rebounds on Again, when you look at these stats, they're not mind-blowing. But you got to remember, as a collective, they were so deep. When you think about 18-point-something here, 17-point-something here, 16-point-something here, and then you had Vinnie Johnson and all these other people, god dang, the team was just collectively deep. 50.5% shooting. Beyond his solid efficiency from the field <laughs> as a guard, he also shot 85% from the free throw line and 48% from three-point range. He didn't shoot many three-pointers, but when he did, he made it basically half of the time. Joe was one of the best perimeter defenders in the entire NBA, as he made first-team all-defense this season and would go on to make five all-defense teams in total. His defensive prowess was incredibly crucial to their success, considering the fact that he would often be the one guarding guys like Michael Jordan, Clyde Drexler, Reggie Miller, and Dennis Johnson. On top mm. of all of this, he would save his signature performance for that year's NBA Finals, which we'll get into more later. Starting the season at the small forward position was the 33-year-old legendary scorer, Adrian Dantley. He was productive for about half of the season, which but after they would move heads on with the from, team leader Isaiah Thomas for some uh, time, Dantley was traded McGuire, for another star McGuire, and a great remember. scorer as well, the 6'6", 29-year-old Mark Aguirre. Mark had averaged 25 points per game in the seven years with Dallas before he joined the Pistons. Mm -hmm. And although he was capable of continuing to put up superstar numbers, less was required of him on the super team Pistons. In the second half of that year with Detroit, Aguirre averaged 15.5 points and 4.2 rebounds on 40. Again, these stats aren't going to blow you away because you're going to look at like only 15.5. No, guys, it's a collective. The whole team It's a squad. And when you start adding everything up, 90, 100 here, whatever. As long as they got the dove, they can give a damn about their stats and they played as a team. Gotta love that. 48% shooting. Starting at the power forward spot was the team's enforcer, the 6'10 Rick the Horn. From a scoring standpoint, he was certainly the least talented player in the Pistons starting five. With that being said, he still had plenty to offer. He was one of the toughest Jeez. and most physically punishing Sally players in Rodman. the entire league Jesus and a solid Christ. defender as well. If a wing managed to get past his Ooh. defender and attack the rim, there was a good chance Mahorn was the guy who was oh. meeting him there and making him pay for it. The Look how physical it is. And they just do it Bill Lambeer. Who I've said in a previous video is my choice for the dirtiest player in <laughs> NBA history. Dirtiest from player. From a quote from the legendary Larry Bird, he said Rick Mahorn would try to hit you on defense, but Bill Lambeer would try to hurt you. Damn. The flagrant foul did not exist in the NBA until the 1990 season, meaning that up to that point, Lambeer would get his money's worth for every foul he committed on the offensive jeez, player. Jeez, Due to got this, the Lambeer in the middle of an all-out brawl was quite a common occurrence. With that being said, the physical nature of the 6'10 setter is what he's known and remembered for, but beyond that, he's actually got a lot of skills on the court. He was one of the elite rebounders in the game, and a former rebounding champion. Along with that, he was a pretty good three-point shooter and a solid stretch five option before it became popular in the NBA. With this skill set, Lambeer would often successfully run the pick and roll and the pick and pop with Isaiah Thomas. On the season, he averaged 13.7 points. Again! You look at the stats and you think, what? 13.7 points a game, 9.6 reads, rebounds, 1.2 blocks, but 50% for the fill. Now, he was a scratch big, so he was the one that would take him out to the three-point arc. But, damn, y'all. <laughs> he was a problem. When I say I hate it, Detroit, listen, I don't wish no harm on any of these players. They're the reason why I became a Bulls fan. The Detroit Pistons 
is the reason why I'm a Bulls fan. <laughs> Thank you, Detroit. Your mugs. <laughs> 9.6 rebounds and 1.2 blocks on 50% shooting, 35% from three-point range, mm. and 84% from the free throw line, mm. making him a rare and extremely efficient NBA center. The starting unit was scary enough as it is, but coming off the bench were two men who were both worthy of being a sixth man of the year. The first was a man we know very well. There's that a man. 27 year old, tenacious Dennis Rodman. <laughs> the worm. In only 27 minutes per game, he averaged 9 points and 9.7 rebounds. He didn't shoot the ball much, but when he did, he made nearly 60% of his shots. His greatest attribute at the time was without question his defense. He had incredible stamina and was very quick and would frequently make the offensive player uncomfortable. Despite the mm -hmm. fact that he was coming off the bench, Rodman still made first team all defense that season. That should tell you how good he was. The second guy off the bench was known as the Microwave, the 6'2 Vinny Johnson. Vinny got that nickname Vinny because he was known to heat Johnson. up quickly he heat and up. score plenty of buckets the boy can heat up. spurts, which made him a terrific spark off the bench. That season, he put... Hey, let me tell you. When you think about players, that was a problem. This man can heat up like nothing. <laughs> It didn't matter. He could just go out there, boom, three. Nice shot from the wing. Boom, from the hash mark. It didn't matter. The man was just good at his job. So you can say whatever you want, you know, about Vinny. He's a hell of a player, man. Daly, who famously earned his spot as the head coach of the Dream Team. Chuck displayed as a leader what the Pistons were all about, as he embodied their passion and intensity in his fiery coaching style. Although this unit was poised to win their first championship in the 89 season, it's worth quickly noting that had it not been for a highly controversial foul call in Game 6 of the 88 Finals, known as the Phantom Foul, then these Pistons may have been entering the 89 season as the defending <laughs> What the hell champions. was that? But that's for another video, that boy, so let's continue. What did he blow on? Looking at the results of this group over the 1989 season, we see that the Pistons finished with a league-best 63-19 and record. Ooh. They statistically had the third-best defense third best and defense. the number 7th ranked offense, offense that season. Like, ah, yeah. They beat teams by an average of 5.8 points over the season. They dominated the playoffs with a 15-2 record, although they did not have that season's MVP, who was Magic Johnson. This Okay, let me go back here. Hold on. All right, let that play through. Had the third best defense and the number seventh ranked offense that season. They beat teams by an average of 5.8 okay. points over the season. They dominated the playoffs with a 15 and 2 record, okay. although they did not have that. All right, so here we go again. 63 and 19, third best defense, seventh best offense. Seventh best best offense beating a team by an average of 5.8 points but 15 and 2 in the playoffs of course they beat my bulls in there so let me put that in the <laughs> so good stats but again not mvp in the team and of course magic one like you said i think those are good stats i mean can you imagine a team going 16 sorry uh 33 63 and 19 now it would be awesome and hell no matter what, their team defensively and offensively are in the top 10. So that's a good thing, in my opinion. Let's go. That season's MVP, who was Magic Johnson. This Detroit team played an unselfish style of basketball where everyone contributed and made the extra pass. They had five players who averaged double-digit scoring, and defensively, they worked as a unit as well. What really makes this team stand out wasn't just their unique style Ooh, and intensity. It wasn't just their level of talent on paper or their unity as a group. But mm -hmm. in large part, Ooh. it was because of how they dominated the postseason <laughs> and who they dominated. They swept the Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish led Boston Celtics in the first round. Then in the semifinals, they swept mm. the Ricky Pierce and Sidney Moncrief Don't led show me. Bucks. In the Eastern Conference Finals, they beat Jordan, <laughs> Pippen, and the Chicago Bulls in six games. <laughs> Waiting for them in the NBA Finals was the I team quit. that defeated them last year, the defending champion Los Angeles Lakers, who were actually seeking their third straight title, led by the MVP, Magic Johnson. And they swept the Lakers. The Lakers had also the Lakers. a perfect 11-0 through the Western Conference playoffs. So the Bulls so was the only least, team to give them a problem that year. hard-fought series was expected between these two juggernauts. And but it wasn't. But that didn't happen. 
Joe Dumars led the way as they convincingly swept the Lakers in four games to secure their first ever NBA championship, which many people think should have come one year earlier. Dumars was the finals MVP, putting up numbers of 27.3 points and 6 assists on 50. Damn, 27.3. Didn't do it in a regular season, but in an isolated four-game series. Can you imagine if he averaged that the whole season when he'd been the MVP? 7.6% shooting. It is important to note that Magic Johnson did injure his hamstring in the third quarter of Game 2, so the mm. Lakers might have posed a greater threat if that had not occurred. Regardless, this was an all-time great team that would go on to win the title again the following year. Detroit had the players, skill sets, and talent to be an elite team in any era oh under my any God, rules of basketball. But if you play by their rules, you're going to be hard to find any miles. team who could beat the 1989 Detroit Pistons. The 1971-72 Los Angeles. All right. So. So I write this down here. Detroit. I know a lot of people in the comments going to be like, F Detroit. I feel you. I feel you. But you can't take it away from them how good they were. They were brutal. They were dominant. They were physical. They were the bad boys. Like I said, I'm a Bulls fan beat us of detroit so thank you detroit <laughs> again detroit piston fans speak up baby let's go angeles lakers the lakers organization has a long rich history of success and have had several teams with a worthy <laughs> argument for the title of greatest team of all time as good as the Shaq and Kobe Lakers were and the Showtime Lakers of the 80s, there's a strong likelihood that the first Los Angeles championship team might have been the greatest of them all. To start the season, the Lakers had the 6'3 Jerry West starting at point guard, the 6'1 and underrated Gail Goodrich was starting at shooting guard, Elgin Baylor was at the 3 spot, the 6'7 Happy Hairston was at the 4, and the dominant Will Chamberlain, Chamberlain. was starting at center. Rounding out the roster was guys like Jim McMillan, Keith Erickson, Flynn Robinson, Lee Royalis, Pat Riley, John Trapp, and Jim Clemens. Heading into this season, this team was not expected to be as good as they would be. In the past few years, they had come close to winning the NBA championship multiple times, but they couldn't get it done. They had been dealing with numerous injuries, and on top of that, their best players seemed as if they were past their glory days, as Jerry West was 33, Wilt Chamberlain was 35, and Elgin Baylor was 37 years old. On top of all of this, they were entering this season with their third coach in only four years. It Damn. appeared as if their championship window had completely shut but the new coach would soon change that perception. Bill Sharman was a former Boston Celtic who several of the Lakers players competed against while he played in the NBA. Sharman's emphasis on team play and fast break basketball would do wonders for this group. He came in with high expectations and a fierce work ethic and quickly changed the culture for the Lakers. Many of the Lakers players said that those preseason workouts were the toughest workouts they've ever been a part of. He had the team in great shape and the focus continued to be on transition basketball. So he just brought At the best point, out of Will Chamberlain's That's good. days of averaging 50 points for were those well who say coaching him, is instead, the coach is Sharman not important. focusing more on a team game, which ended up fitting perfectly with this new Lakers offense. In years past, typically teams with Wilt Chamberlain didn't run the fast break much because although Wilt would secure the rebound, his teammates would wait for him to get up the court so they could feed him the ball down low, since he was the focal point of their offense. But now, Wilt was used to get the fast break started with his amazing rebounding and his elite outlet passing as he then relied offensively on his mm. other Laker weapons. Along with those key aspects of his contributing was Wilt's all-time great rim So protection. is that the original showtime? Wilt stood seven foot one <laughs> inches tall and had a seven Damn. foot eight inch wingspan, which he used that to its fullness all season sick. long to shut down the opposing teams in the paint. On the season, Wilt averaged 14.8 points, 19. Now think about this for a second. Wilt Chamberlain, one of the greatest of all time. His stats, people, are just, was just 14.8 points a game, but 19.2 rebounds with four assists a game. 65% from the field. So we're talking about one of the greatest, the man that held up the 100, you know, because he scored 100 points in the game. Some people look at those stats and go, oh, man, Wilt was past his time. No, it's what he was needed in this offense. That's what they needed. And like I said, pieces, you know, along with him, Jerry, Jerry, Rest, Jerry West and uh, Elgin Baylor, 
that's what they needed, and that's what they got out of it, which is good. Point two rebounds and four assists on 65% shooting. Unfortunately, blocked shots were not tracked until a later date, Boo. but I'm sure Wilt would have averaged a ton of them. For this new offense, Sharman wanted Jerry West to play more as the floor general and be the team's main facilitator. It translated to West averaging a career high and leading the league with 9.7 assists per game that season. Okay. He also okay. averaged 25.8 points and 4.5. Again, now you see, you see the difference. You see the difference. He was the guy that was the scoring because he got a lot of that from when, you know, uh, Wilt Chamberlain throwing the ball out after uh, getting a rebound or a blocking a shot, and he kicked it out for the fast break. So it led to 25.8 points a game. But, man, also have 9.7 assists a game is nuts. And then 4.2 rebounds and 47.7 from the field. Good stats. Two rebounds on 47.7% shooting. Despite all the scoring from West, he was actually not the team's leading scorer that season. That honor went to the underrated legend I mentioned earlier, their starting shooting guard, Gil Goodrich. This was Gil's breakout season as he was the main beneficiary of West's new role as a distributor in transition. Gil played all 82 games that season and averaged 25.9 points, 4.5 I never even heard of this dude, but he was the hus the leading scorer on this team of all these legends because of they were, were you know the kick out the fast break you know between um West and Chamberlain. So hey, just like we said, beneficiaries, let's go. Assists and three point six rebounds on forty eight point seven percent shooting. Despite a solid game plan and coaching scheme, after nine games into the regular season, the Lakers were off to a bumpy 6-3 and three start, as they hadn't quite played <laughs> the fast-paced transition basketball that Sharman had envisioned. A major part of that was Elgin Baylor's age and his deteriorating knees. He mm. couldn't quite keep up with the quickness of the rest of the Lakers' offense. Sharman approached Baylor about a reduced role where he could come off the bench and allow mm. younger players to get a starting minutes. But instead, Baylor recognized this as a sign that he couldn't play the game as well as he wanted to, and decided to retire on the spot just nine games into the season. Wow. Losing one of the greatest players the game has ever seen might initially seem like a detriment to the team, but it was actually quite the opposite on a historic level. Wow. Replacing Baylor at the starting small forward position was the 6'5", 23-year-old Jim McMillan, who with his coast-to-coast -coast scoring abilities was more than happy to help push the tempo of the Lakers' offense. He also revealed himself to be a reliable wing defender. Now with the perfect nucleus to execute the game plan as intended, the Lakers weren't just rolling, they were steamrolling the competition. Immediately <laughs> after the departure of Baylor, the Lakers went on their legendary winning streak. The previous record for the most consecutive wins was at 20 games, and the Lakers they went would make that streak look laughable. Los Angeles went through the entire months of November and December without losing a single game. They set the new NBA record at yep, 33, 33 straight wins, an astonishing feat that still stands to this day. Now think about that again. You have the Bulls that had lost only 10 games. You had um, uh, Golden State only lost 9 games. And there's a lot of other teams that lost 11 or 12 or whatever. And they didn't break that record of 33. That's what's crazy. That all those wins and they didn't win 33 or more straight. So kudos to the Lakers organization on that. that Their streak was team. snapped by Kareem, Oscar Robertson, and the defending champion Milwaukee Bucks. Keeping the suspense, the Milwaukee still might eliminate the Lakers once again in the playoffs. The Lakers continued their dominance throughout the regular season and were hitting their stride again just Ooh. in time for the playoffs. Mm. Just a week before the postseason was set to begin, they defeated the 51-win Warriors by a ridiculous 63 points. Ooh. They finished the regular season with a 69-13 record, which was an NBA record for a couple decades afterwards. Into the playoffs the now, Bulls and they came it. out of the gate strong, sweeping the 57-win Chicago Bulls in four games. And it was the Laker backcourt that led the way, as Goodrich and West each averaged an efficient 28.5 mm. points per game. The next series was a matchup with the 63-win and defending champion Milwaukee Bucks. Despite the star power and championship experience on that Bucks squad, the Lakers group was still ultimately too much, as they beat the Bucks in six games. The NBA Finals was more of the same, as they comfortably beat the New York Knicks in only five games. Mm. Goodrich led the team in scoring that series with 25.6 points, but it was Wilt Chamberlain who took home the Finals MVP, putting up 19.4 points and 23.2 rebounds on 60% shooting. Looking at the results of this group over the 1972 season, we see that the Lakers finished with a record-setting 69-13 record. 
They statistically had the second-best defense and easily had the best offense overall that season. They beat teams by an incredible average of 12.3 points per game over the course of the season, which is easily the best margin of victory of all the teams in the GOAT series so far. They dominated the playoffs with a 12-3 record, although they did not have that season's in. Again, we look at these stats, and you go, wow. So, that was the record before the Bulls broke it. Uh, 69 and 13, but to have the defense and offense ranked like that. So I noticed when I was listening to him, so the Lakers played Eastern conference teams in the first round and cause they said, so where was the Lakers position that was the league? Like they just had the best teams in there. It wasn't conference separated or nothing. You know, again, if somebody in the comment section knows that, I mean, I'll look it up after I look at this video, but they played uh, the Bulls, it said, and they also beat the Knicks in uh, Milwaukee. I'm thinking, huh? <laughs> so maybe it was just the best teams got in at that time. It wasn't a conference alignment. MVP, who was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. To say the Lakers simply dominated the rest of the league this season would be a significant understatement. Along mm. with their record win streak and their record win total, they also led the league in points, rebounds, and assists, and they scored at least 100 points in 81 out of the 82 Jeez. regular season games. The 72 Lakers were the perfect storm of talent, experience, coaching, and chemistry that led them to have a legitimate case for the title of greatest team of all time. The 2016-17 ah, ah, ah. Warriors. Here we go. Here we go. Now we're going to a little more current, you know. So the Warriors. Um... Now, I'm biased. Like I said, I said the Bulls is the best team. I'm sorry. The Bulls is the best team to me. I'm biased because I'm a Bulls fan. But when you look at the the, the Lakers of that year, um, what was that, 71-72 season, I didn't know Elgin Baylor had retired at, after just feeling like he wasn't worthy of playing on the field anymore. Would you have retired? I wouldn't have. I would have just taken a, you know, a role player role. I was just taking coming off the bench being a sixth man. But that team was built around Chamberlain getting those offensive re excuse me defensive rebounds and kicking it out. Uh, Jerry West was awesome, also good as well. And I mean, you can't take it away from it. A lot of people will say, "Well, that was a different time at the time." Is that their fault? No. So they can only play against what's in front of them. So. Here we go, man. Golden State Warriors, baby. <laughs> who have an incredibly strong case for the title of greatest team in NBA history. Mm. More often than not, they felt simply unfair. They were coming off of a 2016 campaign where they had the greatest regular season of all time at a record of 73-9. and That ended with an incredible disappointment losing Game 7 of the NBA Finals in its last moments. They simply improved in the offseason by replacing their small forward who shot a repulsive 34% in the playoffs with a mm. former MVP winner in the prime <laughs> of his career. The championship was theirs. Hey, me and my brother, uh, boss man, I'll use boss man because I don't know you want me to use his name online uh, like that. But anyway, we argued about that so much. It's like Kevin Durant chose the easiest road. That's what I said. He could have went to any other team. He went to Golden State. He was like, so? <laughs> now, he say that, and he is the biggest LeBron hater. He does not like LeBron, which I don't even know why. But rightfully so, Kevin Durant can choose where he wants to go. I was just nitpicking because I felt like I'm the kind of person, like, I feel like I can get on any team, and I'm going to win the championship with this team. That's, that's the type of person I am. So when it didn't go that way, I just kind of felt like he just chose the easy role. But whatever, let's go. <laughs> day they signed Kevin Durant. I even said so on Facebook the day of. I'm not looking for kudos here. I'm just pointing out that it was that obvious. Part of the recruitment pitch to Kevin Durant came from the great Jerry West, who told Kevin, imagine all of the open looks you'll get if you sign with us. Jerry was correct. <laughs> it was a luxury for Kevin Durant to play alongside of two of the greatest shooters of all time, Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. Due to this, Durant's 2017 campaign easily became the most efficient season from the field of his career. But enough about just the addition of Durant. Let's get into the roster as a whole. Starting at the point guard position was the defending unanimous MVP, Steph Curry, whose numbers took a slight dip when having to share the load with the newly acquired Kevin Durant. But Steph still averaged 25.3 points. Again, he just said his points fell because of Durant there, but still the man averaged 25.3 points a game, 6.6 .6 assists, and 4.5 rebounds. 
46.8% from the field. And most of that were three-point attempts, y'all. Enough said. Let's go. 6.6 <laughs> 6 assists and 4.5 rebounds on 46.8% shooting. He also shot 41.1% from three on a league-leading 10 three-point attempts per game. You know what you're getting from Steph, the league's greatest shooter with limitless range, who's incredibly difficult to defend considering how much he moves and oh. plays without the basketball. The way he demands Kawhi constant Leonard, attention and spaces the defense <laughs> oh, naturally the makes bitch. the offense easier for everyone on his team, including Klay Thompson, who was the starting shooting guard and who also shot 41% from three-point range. As many of you know, it wasn't just Clay's ability to shoot that made him stand out, but he was also a terrific on-ball defender. As the ultimate 3 and D type of guy, Clay had an excellent season with career-high scoring numbers of 22. Again, 22.3 points a game, 3.7 re no, yeah, rebounds a game, 2.1 assists. So he wasn't really looking to facilitate through passing because he was like, yo, I'm open, get me the ball. 2.3 <laughs> points, 3.7 rebounds, and 2.1 assists on 46.8% shooting. Kevin Durant was at the small forward position and made one of the most seamless transitions a superstar has ever made into a new offense. Mm. The seven foot sniper put up his usual fantastic numbers of 25, 8, and 5. Now, think about that. You got three players averaging 20 plus, 22 plus points a game, something like that. Um, but 25.1 points a game. And then 8.3 rebounds a game and 4.8 assists on 53.7% shooting. You still got Draymond Green to look at. Lord, this team was a problem. Five on 53.7% shooting. Although he started at the small forward position, thanks to his length and defensive IQ, the Warriors mm. were actually able to move him to the power forward position when mm. using what they called their death lineup. Durant's interior defense was a major part of why the small ball approach was able to work so well, as he averaged a career high in blocks up to that point at 1.6 per game. KD provided all of this on a personal career low of 33.4 minutes per game. He was able to play so few minutes and reserve himself for the playoffs largely because of how the Warriors were simply blowing teams out with their overwhelming talent, and as a result, he often didn't have to play much of the fourth quarter. Assisting him defensively was their starting power forward and their Draymond center Green. in the death lineup, Draymond Green. Draymond's usual contributions were seen on pretty much every... Now, see, you look at Draymond's stats, you'll think, ugh, 10.2 points a game, but look at those rebounds, 7.2, and look at the assists, 7, and then the steals, and then the blocks, then the percentage. I mean, I know Draymond Green gets a lot of hate, but Draymond Green was a must-needed part, a part of that that team plus uh andre iguodala i mean i don't remember too many people on the bench but that starting five man lord defensively and offensively man they were a problem free area on the stat sheet as he was widely seen as the team's anchor on both the offensive and defensive end of the court on offense he worked as one of the team's main facilitators mm. and actually led all of the warriors in assists <laughs> On defense, he was an absolute dog, mm. harassing the opposing team, leading the league in steals, he was top 15 in blocks, and he was that season's defensive player of the year. At one point, Draymond actually became the first player in NBA history to get a triple-double without scoring 10 points, when he had 11 <laughs> rebounds, 10 assists, and 10 steals against the Memphis Grizzlies. Wow. Starting at the center position was the 6'11 Zaza Pachulia, who wasn't anything too special, but he was a big who could set screens, make the extra pass, and fit within the team's unselfish offense. With that being said, regardless of the fact that he was the starter, Zaza still played in only 18.1 minutes per game, and that in large part was because of their death lineup, which instead featured more of Andre Iguodala, who was a solid wing with experience, who could help facilitate, and was a reliable wing defender down the stretch of games. Contributing off the bench were decent pieces like Ian Clark, Sean Livingston, David West, and JaVale McGee. There was oh, no shortage David of ways that this that group team. could attack you. They could suffocate you defensively, they could shoot the lights out from deep, they could punish you in the mid-range, they could push the tempo, they could execute in half-court sets, they could lose you with their incredible ball movement, and they could beat you with isolation plays. It's almost as if no game plan could work against this unit. 
Looking at the results of this group over the 2017 season, we see that the Warriors finished with a league best 67 and 15 record. They statistically had the second best defense and had easily the best mm. offense overall that season. They beat teams by an incredible average of 11.6 points over the course of the regular season, which is the fourth highest margin of victory in NBA history. They absolutely dominated the playoffs with a record setting 16 and 1 record, although they did not have that. Again, you look at the stats, they lost 15 games. Now think about it, as good as that team is or was. They lost two games. I mean, um, 15 games, but only lost that one in the playoffs. So I'm always looking at like the records and think that a lot of the times the team just knew they were going to win. Um, and they're like, hey, we're going to win it, so let's just not get injured. That's when I always look at stats like that, always go. That's the only thing I can come to mind is that they just did not want to get any injuries, so they just said, hey, Let's just get the season over with and with no injuries and go in the playoff and kill Season's everybody. MVP, who was Russell Westbrook. This Warriors unit did absolutely everything well. And when I say everything, I mean literally everything on the court. They were obviously assassins from three-point distance throughout the season, including one performance where four different players hit at least four three-point shots, making them the first team to ever achieve that feat. They had incredible ball movement and frequently made the extra pass, as they averaged 30.4 assists in the regular season, which was the fifth highest in NBA history. In the playoffs, Golden State had seven games where they had at least 30 assists as a team. The rest of the playoff teams combined could only match the Warriors seven games with at least 30 assists. Not only were they playing a team-oriented style of basketball, but it was smart and clean basketball as well. In franchise history, the fewest turnovers in an NBA playoff game was just seven turnovers. The Warriors not only tied that record, but they did it three separate times in this postseason alone. In the regular season, they beat teams by at least 40 points on three separate occasions, which is tied that for the most in funny. league history. That Embarrassing the opponent funny. was a constant for this group, like he looked like even he was throughout pointing the playoffs. At the score. They swept the Portland Trailblazers in the first round, they swept the Utah Jazz in the second round, and they swept the San Antonio Spurs in the Western Conference Finals. Throughout the West playoffs, they beat teams by an average of 16.3 points, which is the greatest deficit of all time. In the NBA Finals against LeBron and the Cavaliers, they continued to handle their business. They went up 3-0 in the series before finally losing their first game in their postseason run. Their 15 straight playoff victories is once again the most in NBA history. There's no other way to say it. The amount of records that this team broke in just one season is absolutely astonishing. If I'm being honest, in a way, I think this team has been taken for granted. Yes, Kevin Durant made a free agency decision that many people viewed as weak and tons of basketball fans <laughs> didn't appreciate. And I also recall that throughout the postseason, they dominated to such an extent that most fans in the NBA community were calling those playoffs boring. And because of these aspects, so, I don't think that the 2017 to Warriors, Warriors fans didn't are remembered care. as fondly as many other great teams of years past. But even if there is some truth to that, being completely objective, you can't deny the fact that the 2017 Warriors provided some of the most quality, beautiful, and excellent basketball ever displayed on the court. The 2012-2013... to Alright, now we're going to go to Miami Heat. So obviously this was a good squad, but... You think that takes away from Golden State, you know, Warriors' success? Uh, they picking up uh, Kevin Durant. I mean, think about it. If uh, Cleveland had picked them up, would everybody be crying differently then? No, they'll be crying as well. Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Love, and LeBron James. That would have been a cheat code too. But uh, you can't take away greatness, people. Whether you like it or not, you can't take it away. I know people get angry, but hey, it is what it is, and. That Golden State Warriors team was a problem. Of course, uh, the team that broke the record, they didn't win the championship. So I always say my Bulls is the best because they won the championship that year. But I'm being biased, people. Calm down. So let's go ahead and move on to the Heat and let's see what he got here. The championship apex of the big three super team. It's easy to simply remember this team for the dominance of their three stars. But in this season especially, they were so much more than just that. They had depth shooting, a great coach, and a defensive mindset that made them difficult on both ends of the court. Starting at the point guard position was the 6'2 Mario Chalmers. He certainly wasn't one of the stars that made this group a super team, 
but he was a key piece nonetheless, as he put up over 8 points, 3 assists, and 1.5 steals on 43% shooting in 26 minutes per game. He was also one of their reliable floor spreaders, as he had a career year shooting 40.9% from 3-point range. At the shooting guard spot was the dynamic Dwayne Wade, who wasn't quite in his prime anymore, but was still one of the best at his position, as he averaged about 21, 5, 5, and 2 steals on 52.1% shooting. Wade, as usual, was a... Again, when you look at stats like that, you'll go, was that good? I'm like, you got LeBron, you had Chris Bosh on that team. Yeah, those stats are good to me. 21.2 points a game, 5.1 assists, and 5 point, I mean, just 5 rebounds a game, 1.9 steals on 52.1 shooting. Damn. Elite on both sides of the basketball, as he was well above league average in steals and blocks among guards. Starting at small forward was arguably mm. the greatest version of LeBron James we've ever seen <laughs> in an obvious MVP campaign. At this point in his career, he had the perfect blend of experience, maturation, athleticism, and confidence as he was now the clear leader of this team. This was also a career year on the defensive end of the floor as he finished second overall in the Defensive Player of the Year race, and many think he should have won the award this year over the mm. Grizzlies' Marc Gasol. LeBron put up his typical stat line. Look at that. LeBron is still averaging that today. This man averaged 26.8 points, 8 rebounds, 7.3 assists, 1.7 steals on 56.5% shooting. Uh, acknowledge, man. I mean, there's haters, but you can't take away from what this man does on the court. You can't take it away. Of 26.8 points, 8 rebounds, 7.3 assists, and 1.7 steals on an unbelievable 56.5% shooting. Mm. That level of efficiency from the field is impressive for a center, but for a small forward, it's basically unheard of. This was also the best year of his career from three-point range, as he shot an elite 40.6% from that distance. It was an all-time great season in terms of superstar efficiency. At one point, LeBron had six straight games where he scored at least 30 points while shooting at least 60% from the field. That's wow. the longest streak in NBA history. Quality shot selection and efficiency wasn't just a trait from LeBron this season, but it pretty much summed up the team as a whole, and all three of their superstars had their best or their second best season in terms of efficiency. That's one of the luxuries of playing alongside of other superstars. You get much cleaner looks. Mm. Starting at power forward was the 6'8 Udonis Haslam, who certainly wasn't putting up monstrous stats, but he did provide toughness and veteran leadership. As I mentioned earlier, this Heat team was very deep, and with Haslam's 19 minutes per game, he was typically one of the first guys to head to the bench. More on the bench unit in a moment. But starting at center was the 6'11 Chris Bosh, who tended to be in the shadow of LeBron and Wade, but his contribution was vital to their success, as he put up six. Now, Chris Bosh was the one, in my opinion, that had the most sacrifice on this because he was a bona fide stud in uh, Toronto as part of the Raptors. Uh, then he dropped, you know, you see 16.6 points, 6.8 rebounds, 1.4 blocks, but again, 53.5% from the field. So I know a lot of people like to say, oh, Bosh, he wasn't a big part of that. Yes, he was. He was a big part of that big three. And a lot of people don't understand in the playoffs. I mean, he was a problem in the playoffs. So give respect. Put respect on Chris Bosh's name. 16.6 <laughs> points, 6.8 rebounds, and 1.4 blocks on a career best 53.5% from the field. One of the first players to come off the bench was the 37 year old Ray Allen, mm. who was enjoying his first season with Miami. Even in his old age, he was still one of the greatest threats among role players, as he led everyone outside of the big three in scoring, with numbers of 10.9 points, 2.7 assists, and 1.7 rebounds on 41.9% shooting. He was doing his usual thing from three-point range, as he shot 41.9% from that distance. Believe it or not, he actually wasn't the team's best three-point shooter throughout the regular season, though. That honor would go to the 6'8 small forward Shane Battier. Shane Battier who averaged about the same amount of minutes as Allen, but also shot more three-point attempts on 43% from three-point range. Rounding out the roster were quality pieces like Norris Cole, Chris Birdman Anderson, Mike Miller, and Richard Lewis. With a multitude of quality wings on this team, Jeez. the 2013 Miami Heat became famous for using what they called... I mean, again, 
you know, people could say what they want to say in sense of the big three, you know, you know, blase, blase. That, uh, they had, Wings you know, the big team. three. The 2013 Sorry, Miami Heat became famous for using... You know, they had the big three. So, cheat code. But again, you had the big three, but you had to put a bunch of role players around them to make them good. Because as good as those three are, if they're not, if they don't have enough depth, then they're just another team. So people got to realize that it's it's part of the nature of the beast. But again, I thought that team was very, very good. What they called positionless basketball, where they would use an unorthodox group of players, which traditionally might not seem like a very successful method, but they were quick to prove that wrong and in a major way. During one large stretch of the season, the team got so hot that they went on an absolutely historic winning streak, as everyone was hitting on all cylinders. Jeez. Miami won 27 straight regular season games, Damn. which is the second longest streak of all time, behind the 1972 Lakers, who won 33 straight, and who we covered earlier in this series. To put 27 straight games in perspective, that means Miami went from February 3rd to March 26th without losing a single game. One strong advantage about this team that's worth mentioning is how their core was relatively young, and overall, they had great stamina and endurance. One good way to measure that is how well the team does on the second night of back-to-backs, and this team was literally the greatest ever in that area. Throughout the regular season, on the second night of back-to-backs, they had a record of 15-1, and which is tied for the best record in wow. NBA history. When we look back on the glory days of this team, it's easy to simply look at the slashers in Dwayne Wade and LeBron James. But collectively, they were absolutely dangerous from the perimeter. As Everybody had, had to show guys up. Who shot Everybody at least has to show up for it to work. Per game while shooting at least 40% from that distance, which was LeBron, Mario Chalmers, Ray Allen, Shane mm. Battier, and Mike Miller. Looking at the results of this group over the 2013 season, we see that the Heat finished with a league best 66 win season. They statistically had the ninth best defense and the second best offense overall that season. They beat teams by an average of 7.8 points over the course of the year. They went through the playoffs with a 16 and seven record on their way to the championship. And they had that season's MVP who was. Le so again, we look at the stats and you know, their defense, it says they were ninth, but I'm pretty sure it probably was a lot of games that was closer than what their, uh, uh, their uh, victory Per game was a 7.8, but still, man, seven best offense. Of course, LeBron won the MVP. Again, 66 and 16. That's a damn good record. That's a good record. LeBron James. Through the East playoffs, they swept the Milwaukee Bucks in the first round, comfortably dismantled the Bulls in the second round, <laughs> and then eliminated the Pacers in the East Finals in seven games. Damn it. The NBA Finals were an absolute classic which included yeah, maybe the most spurred. clutch shot in basketball history when Ray Allen did what he was brought on to do and hit yep. a big three to extend the series before Miami eventually won in the seventh game. If San Antonio had won, then their 2013 squad may have been in the series as well. But ultimately, Miami came out on top and solidified their place among the great teams of basketball lore. If you're looking for a GOAT team candidate with young, athletic star power, positionless basketball, an array of shooters, a defensive-minded team, and one of the greatest players of all time at the very height of his powers, then the 2013 Heat may be the team you're looking for, as they have a somewhat underrated case for the title of greatest team in NBA history. The 95 to 90s. Yes, we finally get to the greatest, but, 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 before we get to that team. <laughs> So, again, I know LeBron gets a lot of hatred, you know, because, you know, he put that team together. They had played in the Olympics. I believe it was the Olympics, but they were on that version of the Dream Team or Redeem Team, whatever it was at that time. Um, And he recruited his boys. Let's put together a team. Let's win some championships. And then it was just a matter of what city they were playing. They decided to go with Miami, which it was the right choice. Um, You can hate it or love it. Uh, even though I'm a Bulls fan, I had no problem with it because I was rooting for my team to be a goaded team. Uh, but they didn't. <laughs> they got steamrolled. <laughs> I think that's how people should look at it. You should use it as motivation for your team to just beat that team. But it didn't happen. So, uh, But either way, Miami team, much respect, even though I know a lot of, it has a lot of haters out there. But now it's time, y'all. He saved the best for last, damn it. At least I hope. <laughs> The 95, 96, Chicago Bulls. Six Chicago Let's Bulls. Go. 
recognized by many, maybe let's most, go. as the greatest team in NBA let's go. history. Let's go. Let's go. But once you break it all down, <laughs> just how strong is their case? As many of you already know, the Bulls were coming off of a disappointing second round elimination to the Orlando Magic. I As remember. A result, motivation was certainly not a trait the 96 Bulls were lacking. The major adjustment heading into the season after the elimination was the addition of the worm, Dennis Rodman. Rodman. The Bulls acquiring Dennis definitely wasn't universally seen as a wise move, as Rodman already seemed as if he was at the end of his rope after a dramatic stint with the Spurs. And some analysts felt like Dennis could be the piece that destroys the Bulls organization from the inside. But if there was ever a man fit to handle this challenge... See, that's the thing that pisses me off. You got people who are not part of teams. They're not part of the teams. They're just reporters. And they like to report on BS that has nothing to do with anything except their bias opinion. Dennis Rodman is a hell of a player. Was he a problem? Yes. But when that man was on the field, the court, excuse me, you wanted that. So it's funny to me when you hear these teams, these writers talk that way. I mean, if we just say to hell with the writers and let the players play, you'll see a big difference, man, I swear. It was the psychological genius, Phil Jackson. Jackson has been praised over the years for his brilliance in terms of basketball X's and O's. But what makes him stand out in my mind is how he controls and influences players' emotions, the way he can manage egos and build a culture, even amidst a tumultuous storm of conflict and tension throughout the entire organization. So let's get into the roster he would be leading. Starting at the point guard position is the 6'6 Ron Harper. The 32-year-old guard used to be a star in his own right, as he averaged over 20 points per game in his days with the Clippers before joining the Bulls. When people reflect on the Bulls' great defense, of course, they often bring up Jordan, Pippen, and Rodman, but they often overlook Harper, who was a solid on-ball defender, was a large defender by point guard standards, and was often among the league leaders in steals per game. He put up modest numbers in his 23 minutes per game, but his defensive Again, impact the stats and his ain't gonna show presence it. went well beyond the but stats. He was an very Starting important two piece. was none other than the guy that most people recognize the as the greatest player to ever the live. The greatest of Michael all time. Jeffrey I don't Jordan. care what y'all say. He was 32 years old and at the height of his powers <laughs> in terms of basketball IQ. He fiercely led his team while putting up numbers of 30 points. Look at them numbers. Just look at it. Yeah. 30.4. 6.6, 4.3, 2 .2, 2 .2, 49.5 from the field. <laughs> Goated. <laughs> Four points, 6.6 .6 rebounds, 4.3 assists, and 2.2 steals on 49.5% shooting. He also shot a lethal 42.7% mm. from three-point range this season. The three-point line was a slightly shorter distance at this time, but even with that being said, Jordan's three-point efficiency was good enough to rake him in the top 10 of the entire league. This overall performance resulted in Jordan being named the league's MVP for a fourth yeah, time. Yeah, man. He was also a monster defensively, making first team all defense. Starting a small forward was the tenacious 6'7", Scottie Pippen, who may have had his greatest season on the defensive end, as he not only made first team all defense, but also finished second overall in the defensive player of the year voting, only behind Gary Payton. Along with that, he put up a... I mean, it's weird when you look at his stats, it said 19.4. But man, I swear the man averaged 22 a game. But look at them rebounds, 6.4. Look at the assists, 5.9. 1.7 steals, and 46.3 from the field. Yeah. <laughs> His typical solid co-star production of 19.4 points, 6.4 rebounds, 5.9 assists, and 1.7 mm. steals. Oh, now my internet won't act up. <laughs> it's like, boy, you, you, you watching too much of this right now. <laughs> but again, you can say what you want to say. This team was goaded. Simple as that. The team is goaded, man. You can say whatever you want to say. Put up his typical solid co-star production of 19.4 points, 6.4 rebounds, 5.9 assists, and 1.7 steals on 46.3% shooting. At the four spot was, of course, Dennis Rodman, whose role certainly wasn't to score on the offensive end, but simply to defend and rebound. And in those combined aspects, there's arguably <laughs> nobody better. As Dennis led the league in rebounds with 14.9 per game, 
nearly three rebounds higher than the closest competitor. He was also a first-team all-defense, as Rodman filled the void the Bulls had the previous season in terms of interior defense. That impact can't be understated, as Rodman was even assigned to guard the Magic Shaquille O'Neal at times, mm. a role he relatively did very well in. More on that later. Starting at center was the 7 foot 2 inch Luke Longley, who had modest numbers in his 26 minutes per game and was certainly the weakest spot in their starting lineup. But he what? still fit in well within the triangle <laughs> offense and provided much needed size. I don't in think the it interior. matter. The I think when it came down to the center position, it didn't really matter because, you know, like you say, you got Dennis Rodman. He was matched up with the center position for the most part. But Longley was very important. And of course, they they just showing Tony Kukoc as well. Very vital player coming off the bench. First men to come off the bench were a pair of elite shooters and Tony Kukoc and Steve Kerr. Kukoc yeah. was very ahead of his time as the 6'10 small forward had a solid handle of the basketball and was capable of playing like a guard despite his 6'10 frame. He put mm. up quality contributions in his 26 minutes per game and he also shot a solid 40.3% from three-point range. The skilled forward was rewarded for this performance with the league's sixth man of the year award. Okay. Steve Kerr was far from a statistical monster off the bench, but what he was asked to do, he did extremely well, as he was the pinnacle of efficient shooting, as he was 51.5% from three-point range and 92.9% .9 from the free throw line. In terms of being a spot-up shooting role player, it really doesn't get much more efficient than that. Rounding out the rest of the roster were guys like Judd Bushler, Bill Winnington, Dickie Simpkins, and Randy Brown. With the Zen Master working as the puppeteer, the greatest player on a revenge mission, and with a deep roster and a system built to succeed, the Bulls were set to dominate the league on a level no one had seen before. You could see their intensity and purpose from the early goings, as they started the season with 41 wins and only <sighs> 3 losses, which was the greatest 3 loss start of all time. They were absolutely suffocating on defense, bolstering the league's best defense to go along with their best offense. The Bull starters of Jordan, Pippen, and Rodman made up three of the NBA's five first-team All-Defenders. Since the NBA has had at least 25 teams, the 96 Bulls are the only team to ever accomplish that. When you consider that fact and then throw in Harper on top of it, the Bulls likely had the greatest perimeter defense the league has ever seen. With the Bulls' talented pieces, they could play just about any style of basketball, as they were great in the fast break, they could slow it down and run things through the post while Pippen facilitates as the point forward, they could play a shooting small ball lineup with Kukoc acting as the center, and with their toughness and collective tenacity, they could play as physically as the game permitted. By the end of the regular season, they finished with a record-setting 72 wins. Heading yeah. into the playoffs as possibly I'm sorry, I'm quiet, the strongest guys. favorites I love the championship the league has the ever Bulls. seen. They started by sweeping the <laughs> Miami good about in the three Bulls. games and then comfortably eliminated the New York Knicks in five games, which set them up for a rematch with a team that defeated them the year before, yeah, the Orlando, Orlando Magic. This was a 60-win <laughs> defending conference champion Magic team led by their dynamic tandem of Shaquille O'Neal and Penny Hardaway. This is not the kind of team that's supposed to get swept out of the Eastern Conference Finals. But, but that's they exactly what Jordan and the Bulls did, charging their way Jordan. to the NBA Finals. <laughs> Waiting in the championship series was the 64-win Seattle Supersonics, led by Gary Payton mm. and Sean Kemp. Damn, that they were a strong, defensive-minded team that most years they would be considered as the favorites to win the championship. But not against these Bulls, who started off with a commanding 3-0 lead, before eventually eliminating the Sonics in six games, securing mm. their fourth championship, with Michael Jordan being named the Finals MVP. Looking at the results of this group over the 1996 season, we see that the Bulls finished with a record-setting 72-10 record. They statistically had the best defense and the best offense overall that season. Ooh. Of the teams in the GOAT series so far, they're the only team that finished as the best in both offense and defense. Wow. They Didn't beat teams by an incredible average of 12.2 points per game, which is the fourth greatest margin of victory in NBA history, and only slightly behind the 72 Lakers of the GOAT team so far. They cruised through the playoffs with a 15 and 3 record, and they had that season's MVP. Again, you look at those stats 72 and 10. Number one in both offense and defense efficiency. Margin of victory 12.2 a game. 15 and 3 in the playoffs, still not a record, but still good. And then the MVP was Michael Jordan. Now, I know I'm biased because I am a Bulls fan. But man, that that team was a problem. So 
Yeah. Whatever, let's go. <laughs> who was Michael Jordan. In this series, the word greatest gets thrown around quite a bit. But with this team in particularly, you can't possibly overuse it. They had possibly the greatest player of all time, the greatest duo of all time, the greatest coach of all time, the greatest perimeter defense of all time, the greatest rebounder Jeez. of all time, altogether making a pretty solid argument <laughs> what, what you doing? for the what you title doing? Get of out of greatest here. <laughs> NBA team of all time. The 1986-87. Damn, the Lakers again. I swear to God. 86-87 <laughs> Lakers. So... Again, I'm a little biased because I'm a Lake. I'm sorry, I'm a Bulls fan. Um, that team was just complete. Um, I thought they were going to break the all-time uh, wins in sense of consecutive games, the winning streak that year, but they didn't. They lost back to back only one time. Um, they lost to Denver and then they lost to uh, Phoenix. I remember y'all because I was mad. But <clears throat> when you think of how good that team was. Is a blueprint. And granted, there'll be other people that'll go, no, this team was better, this team was better. Awesome. That's great. Because that's what it's all about. The debate on who's the goaded team. To me, it's the Bulls. Period. Sorry. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> Seven Los Angeles Lakers, who many people consider as the strongest championship group of the Showtime Lakers era. The Lakers organization has an incredibly strong and rich history, with many greats represented by some of the greatest players of all time. Even with all those great teams considered, many people still recognize this 87 group as the greatest Laker team, or even the greatest basketball team of NBA history. No team greater represents the Lakers brand, culture, and identity than the Showtime Lakers, whose fast-paced and exciting style of play helped define an entire era of NBA basketball. Leading this group at the point guard position was none other than the incredibly dynamic Irvin Magic Johnson. The 6'9 point guard had the first of his three MVP seasons as he was the engine that drove the Lakers' high-octane offense. You know, I know this video's going long, but I need watch time. But, you know, when I think about, you know, a lot of the times sitting with my dad talking about basketball, the Lakers or the Celtics definitely were teams that he talked about. Of course, the Hawks, but my dad just loved the Showtime Lakers, the way they played. <laughs> you know, I think about the last game we watched was when the the Hawks took on uh, the Milwaukee Bucks in the playoff. It was right here in my home in Indiana. And uh, I remember just looking at him and his, uh, his vision wasn't the greatest, but he can, he still can hear it and know what was going on because he knew the way the game was being played. So I can just remember him looking and talking about the Lakers back in the days and they would be, they would beat the Bulls. They would beat the Bulls. Then the Bulls beat them. <laughs> Of course, it was an older team, but, you know, my dad is definitely part of the passions of me liking, me loving basketball. I know a lot of basketball didn't get the same love it used to get back then, but that's neither here nor there. My dad used to take me out to the basketball courts in Savannah, Georgia, and he taught me to skyhook, you know, and he would kick my ass with that one shot. <laughs> but, hey. Whatever your memory is with your for your parent, your father, your mother, aunt, uncle, doesn't matter. Put in the comments, you know, this would be a good place to talk about some memories. Let's go. With his sudden and pinpoint decision making, all of his teammates had to be ready at all times for the easier scoring opportunities that, that Magic pass. would provide wow. for them. It was another remarkably productive year for Magic as he averaged about 24 points a league league. Look at that. 23.9 points a game. 12.2 assists. 6.3 rebounds, 1.7 steals, and 52.2% from the field. Damn. <laughs> Leading 12.2 assists, 6.3 rebounds, and over 1.5 and steals on 52.2% shooting. Simply put, it was one of the greatest dual threat seasons the league has ever seen, as Magic wasn't just the NBA's leader in assists per game, but he was also top 10 in points per game, which is easily the highest anyone has ever ranked in scoring while averaging at least 12 assists per game. His support in the backcourt was the underrated 6'3 shooting guard Byron Scott. 
Scott loved to be on the finishing end of Magic's fast break and had a Force solid worthy, mid-range man. pull-up Damn. jumper. Coming down he didn't the lane shoot with a tremendous dunk. amount of threes, but when he did, he was one of the most efficient shooters in the entire league, as he hit 43.6% from that distance, which was the fourth best percentage in the entire league. His offensive impact should get more credit for his team's success, as he put up 17 points per game during the 86-87 regular season. Ooh. Starting at small forward was the 6'9 star, worthy. big game James Worthy. James is one of the most overlooked greats of basketball history and was the perfect running mate for Magic Johnson. James loved to run the floor yeah. and score in transition and was yeah. the most frequent beneficiary <laughs> of Magic's no-look passes. That Look wasn't that, the only man. way he scored his points though. James Damn. was great with his back to the basket the man and in face-up situations with the opponent as he had one of the quickest first steps the game has ever mm. seen. His unique ability to find his way to the paint led him to have an elite field goal efficiency, especially at his position, as he shot 53.9% on the season. He was selected to be an all-star for the second straight season and on the year. So here's my problem. Why isn't Worthy and always in the discussion for best forwards in the league? I mean, 19.4 points a game, 5.7 rebounds, 2.8 assists, 1.3 steals, 53.9% from the field. Worthy was a problem, a game changer. I mean, that fast break and him coming down with that boom dunk, man. Showtime, baby. Let's go. <laughs> year, he averaged nearly 20 points and six rebounds. Starting at power forward was the young AC Green, who always played with hustle and heart, and who was a couple rebounds short of a double-double average in only 28 minutes per game. AC certainly wasn't one of the major stars on the Lakers roster, but his contribution shouldn't be downplayed as he was solid defensively in the interior and he was very reliable at securing the boards. He's also the most dependable player of all time when it comes to availability, as AC is easily the all-time record holder for consecutive games played and only missed three games throughout the entirety of his career. Then, of course, starting at center was the captain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. At 39 hook. years old, Kareem <laughs> certainly that. wasn't anywhere near his prime oh anymore, goodness. but his age didn't stop him from being one of the better centers of the NBA as he poured in his... I mean, you look at his stats and somebody would go, man, that's awful. 17.5 points, 6.7 rebounds, 2.6 assists, 1.2 blocks a game while shooting 56.4% from the field. Really? <laughs> Man. 17 and a half points per game and 6.7 rebounds on his typical incredibly efficient field goal percentage. Despite his age, Kareem was still very capable of finishing in the fast break, but the majority of his production came in half court sets with his iconic sky hook shot, which coming from the seven foot two inch Kareem is probably the most indefensible shot the game has ever seen. Accompanied with their all-time great starting five was a powerful bench, especially concerning the first three players of the second unit. First off is Michael Cooper. Cooper. Cooper is probably the greatest perimeter defender that no one talks about. He was incredibly tenacious with his on-ball defense and was usually the player who was assigned to contain the opponent's best perimeter score. For his career, Cooper made an astonishing eight all-defense teams, and his 1987 campaign was even better, as he was that season's Defensive Player of the Year. He was one of the original 3 and D type of players, as he shot 38.5% from three-point range on 2.8 three-point attempts per game, which, believe it or not, was actually a lot of attempts in the 80s, and he attempted the second-most three-point shots that season among all NBA players. Midway through the season, the Lakers acquired Michael Thompson in a trade. He was a 6'10 center slash power forward who was a finesse type of player. He was a solid scoring threat in his days before Los Zach Angeles, averaging father? as many as 20 points per game. But with this all-time great Lakers squad, he would simply need to be a spark up the bench. And that's exactly what the 32-year-old did, as he chipped in with over 11 points and 5 rebounds on only 23 minutes per game. Also in the heart of the rotation Rambus. was the 6'8 Kurt Rambis, who didn't have a with the glasses. Play, it was a Clark but he was Kent. another one of those players Clark who did Kent. the little things well. <laughs> he would fight for loose balls, help defend the Celtics bigs, and was always a sure thing to give 100% effort. This powerful roster of incredible individual players was a team that seemed tailor-made for Magic Johnson's skill set, as every member of the roster, including Kareem, was excellent at running the floor and pushing the tempo. I know I've alluded to this several Ooh. times so far in this video, but I can't emphasize enough how uniquely fast this group was, as they treated every game possession <laughs> no like it was the start of a track meet. 
Sometimes, it almost seemed like they were completely forcing a fast break tempo, but even then, they still found ways to make it work. If they had to slow things down, they could, as Magic sometimes orchestrated the offense like a quarterback from the top of the key. And there's not many players who are better scoring options in the post than Kareem and James Worthy. Under Pat Riley's strong leadership and insatiable desire to win, this Lakers team had the league's best 65-17 record throughout the regular season. In wow. the playoffs, no one was a challenge for them throughout the Western Conference, as they swept the Denver Nuggets in three games, defeated the Golden State Warriors in five games, and then swept the Seattle Supersonics out of the Western Conference Finals. Waiting for them in the NBA Finals was their rival and true challengers, the, the Boston Celtics. Celtics and Lakers in the this Finals, was simply as Los usual. Angeles this time, though, as they Especially controlled in the, the pace of the series and imposed their will upon Boston, defeating them in six Ooh. games. To go along with Magic's iconic game-winning baby skyhook in Game 4, he also put up an incredibly monstrous stat line, nearly Damn. achieving the first triple-double average in NBA Finals history. It was a series performance that was so impressive that by the end of it, even Larry Bird was conceding that Magic Johnson had become the best player in the NBA. Looking at the results of this group over the 1987 season, we see that the Lakers finished with a league-best 65-17 and 17 record. They statistically had Ooh. the league's best offense and the seventh-best defense wow. overall that season. They beat teams by a strong average of 9.3 points over the course of the season, and they coasted through the playoffs with a 15-3 and record, represented by that season's MVP and Finals MVP. Again, you know, when you look at those stats, you know, you talk about the greatest of all time. Listen, like I said, when I talked about my dad, talk about those Showtime Lakers, it didn't really matter. Um, that team was a problem because it was just that straight run and gun, run and gun, run and gun. So teams were tired, man. Teams were tired. But if you look at those stats, man, that's, that's phenomenal. I mean, even though their defense is down, but that offense, number one, and then, you know, beating the team by a margin there. And then, of course, Magic winning both the regular season and finals MVP. Good team, man. Good team. MVP, Say Magic whatever you Johnson. want. Good There's team. many goat-worthy teams of NBA history, but in a seven-game playoff series, this team may very well be the best of the best. As far as how they would match up against the other all-time great teams, well, I think the key would be for them to control the game's tempo, and if they were able to do that, then there's a decent chance that no one would beat them in a seven-game series, as a high-scoring and free-flowing style plays too much into the hands of this team. The key would be to get them to play in a physical half-court game, which is something the 96 Bulls or 89 Pistons may have been able to do successfully in a hypothetical matchup. The 2013-14 I think we're down to the final team on this and yes the spurs was a very good team so you know you could say whatever you want about any team on this list everybody's got something that makes them unique so unique to the other team and that's what makes teams great it sparks a debate like who was the who was the point guard who was the catalyst of the offense who was the defensive player? Who was the one that got the rebound? Every team's got an argument. Of course, me, I always say it's the Bulls. Listen, I'm a Bulls fan, so I'm going to say that. And there's teams that are not even on this list that this uh, gentleman put together, which is no fault of his own. He's just looking at the statistics. So let's go ahead and wrap this video up with a bow, and let's check out the Spurs, and let's see what their argument for the goatee team is. Let's go. San Antonio Spurs the fifth and final championship team of the San Antonio dynasty. This team is famously remembered for their unselfish style of basketball, and for quite simply, some of the most beautiful team basketball we've ever seen. Veteran leadership certainly wasn't something the San Antonio group was lacking, as they had one of the oldest teams in the league, which was jam-packed with championship experience. Leading this squad was one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time, Greg Popovich who instilled his fighting spirit into this squad. Under the leadership of Popovich, the Spurs played some of the most intelligent basketball I've ever seen. And one of the examples is how they used their spacing and ball movement to completely master the corner three-point shot, which naturally is the most efficient shot in all of basketball. That season, San Antonio was easily the best three-point shooting team in the league, as they hit a remarkable 39.7% from that distance. 
Along with that, the Spurs also led all teams that season in assists per game, with an average of 25.2. Running the floor for this group at the point guard position was the 31-year-old former Finals MVP Tony Parker. Tony operated as the floor general with his sound decision making and his high basketball IQ. Not only did he put up solid numbers throughout the season, but among starting point guards league-wide, Tony had one of the lowest turnovers per game averages in the entire league. Wow. Parker is also an underappreciated defensive guard as he actually finished with some Defensive Player of the Year votes this season. Joining him in the starting backcourt was the 6'6 shooting guard, Danny Green. At this point in history, Green was one of the best 3 and D options in the entire league, as he had just recently broke three-point records in the NBA Finals, and he was an underrated defensive player. Green was fantastic at making the game easier for his teammates, as he was terrific at moving without the basketball, and when his teammates found him open, he was about as sure of a thing as it gets, as he converted 41.5% of his three-point attempts that season. Starting at the small forward spot Kawhi was Leonard. the young and upcoming star Kawhi Leonard. Although Kawhi hadn't quite reached his superstar levels of production, he was still everything the team needed him to be, as he was an absolute pest of a lockdown defender, while efficiently chipping in from the field and from three-point range. With a game of basketball being dominated by athletic wing players, a young Kawhi Leonard was the perfect counter for San Antonio, as they used him as their defensive stopper for the Kevin Durant's and LeBron James's of the world. By far, their weakest link in the starting unit was the big man, Tiago Splitter. With that being said, the 6'11 Splitter still knew how to operate in this team-first engine, as he was actually quite solid as a passer and sufficed decently as a rebounder. It is worth mentioning that although Splitter was a frequent starter, he also only averaged 21 minutes per game, mostly due to San Antonio's solid rotations with their 6th, 7th, and 8th man. More on those guys in a bit. Starting at the center position was the all-time great Tim Duncan. Although he was no longer in his prime, the big fundamental was still very effective. So we talk about goaded players, especially the power forward position. Tim Duncan gets that a lot. You know, they say he was the greatest power forward of all time. I mean, I don't, but he was a good player. Uh, I got Kevin McHale or uh, uh, Carl Malone. You know, whether you like Carl Malone or not, I don't care. I'm going off what they did on the field or the court. But Tim Duncan definitely was a problem. The boy had the bank shot. I mean, he would just turn around, hit it in the square, ball went in. Wow. <laughs> effective at this point in his career, as he was second on the team in scoring while leading the Spurs in both rebounds and blocks. Duncan served as San Antonio's lead by example player, as his defensive presence around the rim was constantly felt even at this later stage in his career. Obviously, you can't talk about the Spurs dynasty without bringing up one of the greatest sixth men in the history of the game, Manu Ginobili. Ginobili was a stabilizing force for the Spurs' second unit, as he was always quick to provide an offensive spark off the bench. He was a multifaceted talent who could finish around the rim, he was a solid three-point option, and he was one of the more underrated passers during that era. Marco Bellinelli and Patty Mills were not far behind Manu off the bench, and despite being role players with limited minutes, these two guys were some of the best shooters on the team, as they were both hitting north of 40% from three-point range. This well-rounded and experienced team finished the regular season with a 62-20 record. Not bad the at Spurs all. The started off the playoffs by being surprised by an overachieving Mavericks team, who pushed the first round to seven Whoa. games. Okay. But after that, San Antonio was locked in, both offensively and defensively. In the second round, they comfortably eliminated a talented Trailblazers team in only five games. And in the Western Conference Finals mm. against the 59-win Oklahoma City Thunder, they eliminated Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, and the rest of that strong team in just six games. The NBA Finals were a rematch with a team that beat them the previous season, the Big Three Miami Heat. The thing is, San Antonio had matured and had significantly improved their chemistry. In the Finals, the Spurs dominated the Heat like they were up against a D-League team as they Damn. had an average margin of victory of a whopping 14 points per game, Ooh. which is one of the largest averages in NBA Finals history. 
At times, the ball movement the Spurs displayed looked like the Harlem mm. Globetrotters toying with the Washington Generals <laughs> as they went on to win the series easily wow, in five games, one. and Kawhi mm. Leonard was rewarded the Finals MVP. Looking at the results of this group over the 2014 season, we see that the Spurs finished with a 62-20 record, which was the best record in the NBA. They statistically had the seventh best offense and the third best defense throughout the regular season. They had the best margin of victory that season as they beat teams by an average of 7.7 .7 points per game on the year. They cruised to an NBA championship, finishing that playoff season with a 16-7 record, although they did not have that season's league MVP, who was Kevin Durant. A lot of different teams have put forth a strong case for the title of the greatest team of all time, but probably none of them did it as unselfishly as the Spurs did in 2014, as they demonstrated beautifully what peak team-first basketball looks like. Given their defensive identity, their well-rounded... I don't know, that team kind of reminds me of what the um, Celtics did. It was just unselfish basketball, just play together and just say team first. That's what I'm getting from that team, that Spurs team that year. The offensive attack and their emphasis on effective three-point shooting, I don't see this team struggling to compete with any all-time great team in a seven-game series, regardless of era. So what do you guys think? Which basketball team is the greatest team in NBA history? I look forward to hearing your conclusion in the comment section below. Thanks for All right, boy, that was a long one. <laughs> but I'm glad I finally sat down and did it, man. This this is a good debate. I mean, you look at the teams he got up there, you know, the 85, 86 Celtics, 82, 83, 76ers, 01, I mean, uh, 2000, the 2000, the 2001 Lakers, the 88, 89 Pistons, 71, 72 Lakers, um, the 16, 17 Warriors, the 12, 13 Heat, 95, 96 Bulls, 86, 87 Lakers, and then the 13, 14 Spurs. So I know there's teams that's left off there. Like I said, this is the team that always, these are the teams that are always in the discussion as the goaded. So me, I'm biased because Bulls, but. I'm not gonna lie, you know, when you look at when you look at that Lakers team of 86, 87, man, you cannot deny how good that team was. And of course the Boston Celtics, uh 85, 86. You know, the 80s was very competitive uh decade of basketball. It's known as the resurgence of the league, the renaissance, or however whatever big word you want to use when Magic and Bird came into the league, the league was birthed rebirth to a global game to where everybody and their mama watched the NBA. And of course, Jordan was just that stick of dynamite to really make it blow up. So I'm going in this because this is a very long one. Like I said, I have, you know, I got to work on my watch time on my channel. So I definitely wanted to get this video together. I'm going to break it down into chapters. So everybody who watched it, they definitely see it's got chapters in there. But uh, again, what do you, who do you think is the goaded team? Here we go, people discussion. Even if the team wasn't in this video, who's the team that when you see them, when you saw them, you said, no one can beat that team. It doesn't matter which five is on the floor or which 12 you put on, what jersey, what building, it didn't matter. This team was the best. Me, I'm going to say my Bulls can match it with anybody. But again, I'm biased. So again, thank you guys for watching. This was a very extremely long one, but I'm glad if you guys stayed to the end, put in the chat that you stayed to the end. Don't say I forward through the chapters and then I stay to the end. Be truthful to yourself. So again, thank you all for coming to inconspicuous, inconspicuous thoughts. Um, definitely hit that like button, comment, subscribe, share for your boy on all your social media outlets. And again, if you haven't heard it from anyone in your life, you hear from your boy, no matter what, always stay humble and kind. Thank you guys. Love.